Hello, everyone. It's so nice to see folks joining. Um, as is, I think, you know, been custom for the last like two years of attending things on Zoom, we'll wait the, you know, customary extra minute to see if folks are going to join us and then we'll go from there. All right, so I think in the interest of time, we can go ahead and get started. So it's it's super exciting to see so many folks here. Um, this is the fullest Zoom room I think I've seen in a little while. Um, so the way this is going to go is I'm going to uh, speak a little bit about um, uh, the new professional and student committee, introduce our speakers, and then we're going to have about 30 or so minutes um, of presentation from Rebecca and Jesse, who are here with us, um, and then 30 minutes um, of some Q&A here at the end at, or until our time runs out. Um, and folks were kind enough to share questions beforehand when they registered. So Jesse and Rebecca have had access to those questions to see what folks are coming to the table interested in learning a bit more about. Um, but my name is Brian Whetstone and I'm one of the co-chairs of the new professional and student committee for NCPH. And I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, uh, finishing up my final year here um, in the PhD program. Um, I'm joined tonight by a few other members of our committee, including my co-chair, Mary Kate. Uh, I see that Michael's here. I think Luke Perez is also here. So some of us are floating around um, this evening. But the new professional and student committee is uh, the committee of NCPH that's really oriented towards new professionals and students. So uh, we try to do uh, things like this event tonight that are are geared towards uh, connecting people with resources about the job market uh, for new professionals interested in things like government jobs. Um, we'll have another public history hangout coming up uh, later this fall that's all about consulting that will have folks from the consulting committee chatting um, in a similar vein as this event organized tonight. Um, and this is part of an ongoing series that we do called public history hangouts that are oriented towards all things um, that are relevant to new professionals and students around public history and NCPH and so on and so forth. We also do a lot of events around the conference itself, like holding a social, um, social hour and scavenger hunt we've done in the past, um, as well as uh, doing some behind the scenes events with various public history institutions. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Jesse and Rebecca and turn it over to them. So Jesse is a historian of the National Archives. She speaks regularly at academic and history conferences, gives lectures, writes articles on the history and importance of the archives. She is the editor of the National Archives blog, Pieces of History, and runs the NCPH Oral History Program. And before becoming historian, Jesse worked at the Center for Legislative Archives in Washington, DC. And she is active in several historical associations, including serving as president of the Society for History in the Federal Government from 2018 to 2019, and is currently the co-chair of the Government Historians Committee for NCPH. Um, and Rebecca lives in Austin, Texas, and is the Cultural Resources Manager Section Director for the Texas Department of Transportation. She holds a master's degree in public history from the University of South Carolina and an undergraduate history degree from Tulane University in New Orleans. 
And prior to joining um, the Texas uh, DOT in 2013, Rebecca worked at the South Carolina State Historic Preservation Office in Columbia, South Carolina for 10 years. And during that time, she served as the supervisor for compliance, tax incentives, and survey work, and as the state tax credit program coordinator. And currently she serves as a committee member for Preservation Austin and leads that group's initiative on identifying LGBTQ plus historic places in Texas's capital city and is the co-chair for the National Council on Public History's Government Historians Committee and is an avid volunteer in her community and a member of the St. Martin's Lutheran Church Choir. Uh, so uh, Jesse, Rebecca, I will turn it over to you if you'd like to say some things about the Government Historians Committee and get us get the ball rolling here. Awesome, thank you so much, Brian, and everyone for joining us today. Um, we also, um, like, I, like Brian said, Jesse and I are part of the Government Historians Committee of the National Council on Public History. And we also have some current and former members of our committee here too, to hopefully give you some answers to some questions that you may have that um, we don't know. Um, as you can see, we, had rep we have representatives on our committee that work in federal government and that work in the state government, but we also have people that work um, for local governments too, like cities or counties. And, um, you know, we're always open um, for anyone who is thinking a little bit about history in their job <laughs> to be part of our committee. Really our goal of the Government Historians Committee is to advocate for um, obviously uh, historians that are working in government agencies. We're a little bit different from consultants. We're different from people working in academia or for nonprofits. Um, you know, we have different budgets and different, um, we are really influenced by politics and elected officials and, um, you know, Congress and, and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And so um, the ways that we are able um, to do history can be constrained, but they can also be very different than when, what you've ever thought about doing for public history before. And so I think that's some of what we're hoping to highlight um, this evening with everyone who's joined us. So the way that um, <clears throat> we thought we would um, kind of divide up this, this time is that I'm going to start and, and just kind of talk to you a little bit um, but then I'm going to turn everything over to the star of the show, Jesse, who is a federal historian and she hires through USA Jobs. <laughs> and so she's going to take you through that um, fun bureaucratic website and give you some awesome tips and tricks about navigating that. Um, and then, of course, you know, like you said, we have other people in our committee that are here. I saw that Cameron Binkley, who was on our committee, um, is here, and he's an Army historian. And I know some people had a question about working for the military um, and things like that. So, you know, hopefully if you have questions that you put in the chat that we can't answer, some other people from our committee will step in. So I just wanted to take my time um, to talk a little bit about what I do and um, give you some thoughts and ideas about working for the state. I also wanted to take my time to um, talk about like interning and fellowships and networking opportunities if you wanna think about working in the government as a public historian. Oh, and then after Jesse talks, um, we're open for questions. So I know that some of you had questions that you submitted when you registered, we can take others. Um, and it'll be a free for all. So <laughs> we'll answer every question to the best of our abilities. So I work um, for the Texas Department of Transportation. And, um, you know, there was, I saw one of the pre questions that came in was like, what are some of the state agencies that you don't normally think of, or government agencies that you don't normally think of where historians can work? And so I work for the DOT and I work in cultural resource management. Um, and basically it is, um, cultural resource management is a historic preservation type of public history. Um, it's a network of um, requirements put on federal agencies to preserve the nation's historic places. And as part of that, 
you know, it, it goes across federal and state and local agencies and any federal agency that is, that is doing, spending money or granting permits or making decisions or owning land has to manage and understand the cultural resources that are impacted by its decision making. And so the DOT receives a lot of federal money to build roads and do our transportation work. So we work very closely with our federal counterparts at the Federal Highway Administration. And of course, every state has a Department of Transportation that's getting money from the Federal Highway Administration. And most states have cultural resource departments that employ historians and archaeologists. And, um, and there's a lot of other federal and state agencies that are involved in cultural resource management, like the military, like the Department of Defense, because they own a lot of land, like the Bureau of Land Management, the Park Service, because they own a lot of land. Um, the National Guard is another um, state with, it's very similar, it's like a state agency that gets a lot of federal money, like the DOT. And they also manage a lot of land and do a lot of activities. Um, and um, so th those are some of the, the least common, I guess, uh, government agencies, as opposed to things like the State Historic Preservation Office or the State Archives or the State Museum or you know the National Park Service when you're thinking about it from like a historic site perspective. Um, those are some of the different types of jobs in agencies where people are like, oh, I didn't even know we had historians working for the DOT. And, and then a lot of us, and I'm sure you'll talk about this at your next hangout, a lot of us do our work in cultural resource management with consultants. So um, even though the consultants don't directly work for the government, they're doing a lot of work you know, on behalf of the government and needing to understand this cultural resource management um, uh, process and, and things like that. So uh, that's, that's another way that people can be involved. For working for a state or even a local government, as you probably know, every state, every government has its own hiring system. We can't, we're not as easily being like USA Jobs um, but a lot of it's set up relatively in, in a similar concept, right? Um, you have like keyword searches, keyword things that you're looking for. Um, but there are some things that if you are searching for jobs out there, um, there are some additional keywords to think about um, depending on what, excuse me, on what you're interested in doing. So you can do like a keyword search for something like environment or library, or project management, um, or GIS, um, if that's mapping and something is something that you're interested in. And those can help get public history or history adjacent jobs in the government. Um, you know, we are part of the DOT's Environmental Affairs Division. And so our job posting um, for history and historic preservation reads a lot more towards like it talks a lot about environmental regulations and um, things like that because that's just what we're part of and how we're posting the job. And a lot of other places are pretty similar like that. Um, you know, so I've seen jobs posted through like the Department of Natural Resources um, and things that are really cultural resource jobs, but they, they're all lumped together under this environmental umbrella. Um, I just wanted to say too, as far as uh, public history, I can at least speak for my department. So the Texas DOT, um, like I said, we employ historians and archeologists, but we also have an archivist on staff who is like part of our, she's like our photo librarian. So we have a lot of images that we manage. Our state agency is over a hundred years old. And so we have a lot of images that we've created over that time period, including maps, including um, just po pictures, posters, et cetera. And we have a photo library that she archives. We also employ records management staff um, and staff just to help us manage all of our project records and things like that. So those are some of the public history 
um, adjacent fields that we do or directly adjacent. Um, we also have a big GIS department. Um, we also have GIS specific to our environmental who help us work on um, maintaining resources associated with historic places and cemeteries and things like that that are of big interest to us as historians trying to do place-based work. So um, those are just a few ideas of some of the alternative, not typical um, history uh, jobs that you could get for state government. Um, you know, one of the cool things that I really like about TxDOT especially is that we have paid internships <laughs> and we have a summer internship program. And a, a lot of government agencies have something like that already set up. Um, and it's a great way to, to start to network and try to get internships um, that can pay a, a good a good salary while you're actually working for us. And at least in the state of Texas, um, if you get an internship with us, that, that time counts towards state service. So if you continue to work for the state of Texas um, after grad school, you know, that 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 adds to your retirement, which <laughs> to some people may be like, that's a, so far in the future, but it is something that's kind of cool that we offer. And, um, you know, we post our internships online, you know, they have to be open. And so I found that for, a, to, to kind of stay aware of jobs that are out there, especially for the government is, is to use like a job crawler, like indeed.com, you know, and you can set up keyword searches for them to tell you about jobs and things like that. And that's a great way to have that you know, Indeed already has a lot of um, state and local government uh, job websites as, as where they crawl for that and can post things for you. So um, that's really cool. And I think, um, I think as Jesse can talk about too, which I'm about to turn this over to her, but you know, you can have your USA jobs search set up for internship opportunities as well. Um, because some federal agencies, ha you have to go through USA Jobs to get an internship too. So, um, you know, those are some other options for you to kind of test the waters and see if being a government historian is for you. So that's my short little spiel. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Jesse, and I am then going to go look in the chat and see if there are any questions for me. So, thanks. <laughs> Thanks. And I'm going to go ahead and share this link to a, a, a little handout that one of my colleagues put together about um, jobs, uh, USA jobs and jobs in the federal government. But also um, I'll share another link with everyone um, probably tomorrow when I'm done putting together um, this resource page. Um, time got away from me today. And so my name is Jesse Kratz and I'm the historian of the National Archives, which is a federal executive branch agency. And my job is to preserve and promote agency history. So history of the National Archives. Um, but today I'm gonna mainly talk about how to get a federal job um, through the dreaded USA Jobs website. Um, so the little background, the Society of History and the Federal Government, um, which I'm a, a board member of, puts on a federal jobs workshop at least once a year. And I think last year in 2021, um, we did a, a joint uh, workshop with our Government Historians Committee at NCPH at the annual meeting. And this workshop ranges from a couple of hours to like all day. So what I'm talking about is going to be extremely abbreviated. And I'm going to try not to speak really, really fast because I do speak fast sometimes. So I'm trying to get everything in. And so the federal government is the largest employer of historians, especially the U.S. military. They have literally thousands of them. And um, it's not just historians doing historian work. Um, we have public affairs specialists, we have analysts, we have archivists, museum specialists, writers, editors, and many, many more doing um, often public history. And so before I talk about like how to work for the federal government, I did sort of want to give you a little bit about like why, why do you want to work for the federal government? And also like what is the general schedule system? Because you hear GS all the time and you might not know what that is. And so um, today I'm gonna to be talking mainly about GS jobs, the general schedule. And the general schedule is a, basically a classification and pay system that covers the vast majority of federal civilian employees. 
And so for classification, there's a job series um, and they're all numbered. And so if you look at the handout, I provided some examples, but for instance, I'm a historian, I'm a GS0170. Um, but like I said, there are several other series that do actually history work. And then for pay, there are 15 grades and 10 steps. And I'm just gonna share my screen because it's gonna be easier to show you than explain. Um, and I'll be sharing my screen for a little bit of time if I can um, successfully do that. Okay. I hope I can share and if I start going to a website that you can't see, please let me know. And so this is a website that has information about the general schedule of pay. And basically, if you work for the federal government, your pay is determined about where you live. And so I live in Washington, DC. So I'll just scroll down there and show you if you work in Washington, DC, this is um, the pay. I wonder if I can hide this because you can all see that, right? Um, this is the grades, there's 15 grades, and then here's the step, there's 10 steps. In order to go up a step, you need usually a year experience, and in order to go up a grade, you need a year experience. So a lot of the entry-level positions, um, at least the National Archives, but in humanities in general, are five, nine, and uh, five, seven, and nine. So if you're starting as, say, an archives technician at the National Archives, you'll probably come in around $50,000 a year um, to live in Washington. Um, and then I did want to talk a little bit about why to work for the, um, the federal government. And can you tell me, can you, did the page change? Can you see this? Yeah, it did. Okay, good. Um, I, we use Google for everything and I'm so used to Google. And every time I get on Zoom, I'm completely lost. <laughs> and so this page talks about, you, you know, in addition to, you know, helping people and working in public service, which we love, you know, why would you work for the federal government? Obviously the salary, what I just talked about, but also there's a student loan repayment program for a lot of agencies that you can get up to $60,000 back. And then annual of uh, incentives, rewards, you know, spot awards, or if you get a good performance appraisal, they'll usually give you an award. We have alternate work schedules. So you may work an extra hour every day, then you can take every other Friday off. Um, we have a lot of leave. So the longer you work for the federal government, the more leave you get. Um, and telework's really big with the federal government. For instance, I telework 100%. Now I'll pop over the archives every once in a while since it's only a couple miles away to look at records, but I telework um, 100, mostly 100% 100 of the time. And then there's some other benefits like you know a holidays 11 holidays um, insurance dental if you um, have a child or you adopt the child you can get up to 12 weeks of paid leave and then over here there's some more including um, retirement and so that's why you want to work for the federal government but now i guess how do you work for the federal government and let me get to the usa jobs with this thing is the worst i don't want that there um, Okay, go away. I'm gonna to go to the USA Jobs website and just a couple of things to note real quick. These are the kind of the ways you can get to federal service. Now, a lot of people are just the general public. So they'll just, anyone can apply for those jobs. And then there are some jobs open to only federal employees or um, mostly if it's open to federal employees, um, veterans will get a preference. If you're a military spouse, you might be able to have special, you know, special, um, uh, attention to your application. And there's a whole section for students and recent graduates that you should completely look at sometime. I won't go there today. And also looking at the, um, the individuals with disabilities, there is a whole schedule A that, that, that you get hiring preferences if you have a, some sort of disability. And so a lot of people can qualify for those as well if you have a disability. And there's disabilities that you, you wouldn't even think of on there. Um, and then I really just going to go straight to the USA jobs portion here, I think. Um, and I know I did tell you that um, you should apply for, you know, museum curator positions or writer editor, but here's where you really can start um, tailoring your search. Um, you can, if you say you just want to work for just the National Archives, you can just search for National Archives jobs. If you only want to work in Washington, D.C., you can search just Washington, D.C., or you can just search for everything. And, and I'm just going to search for historian because I know there are some historian jobs available, and um, I wanted to go through those real quick. 
And now looking at here, there's seven historian jobs, but there's not really seven, there's really six. Because if you look at this one, this one historian positions on there twice, it's because that agency is trying to cast a wide net for that job. So they've put it for the general public, open to everyone, but it's also open to, you know, uh, employees that have been separated, you know, they've been basically laid off or, you know, if uniformed employees, current federal employees, people with disabilities. And so oftentimes a uh, federal employee will, will apply under both of these, but if you don't qualify for any of these, you apply under that. And then there's two lists that end up going to the person who decides um, who's going to be hired. But that's a 14, so that's kind of high up and a lot, not really very entry level. So I did want to um, kind of highlight these two because they seem like they're the most kind of entry level positions at the um, in the federal government. And so I kind of want to call attention to this section here first because um, it has a lot of the pertinent information. So like pay attention to the opening and closing dates because um, like this one closes today. So if you want to apply for this job, you need to go apply for it right now. And it also says that once they've received 100 applications, they are going to close it. So obviously they haven't got 100 yet, but you might not want to wait till the last minute because a lot of times federal agencies have been doing that because they've been inundated with literally hundreds and hundreds of applications that they don't want to go through. And then here you can see the salary, the pay scale, where the job is located. It's in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, it's telework eligible. You're required to travel 25% of the time. This is, um, this is good. This is very rare. They're going to pay your relocation expenses if you get hired for that job. And then again, it's appointments permanent. It's full time. It's a competitive service. It is the family of the historian, what I am. This one, you'll be a supervisor. You will not be required to take a drug test. Um, you're not going to have to have a security clearance or get a security clearance, but you will get a background investigation and all federal jobs require a background investigation. And then this is just that they're going to eventually give you a badge. And so the kind of the meat of the applicate or meat of the announcement is over here. And um, here, I guess this just says you might have to have a COVID vaccine. This is where the um, job is located and it's funny here that's inconsistent with what it says over on the other side they said after 50 and then again people this job's open to the general public and federal um, service formerly federal service folks who have been laid off and then you can learn about what they do at the department of interior which the national park service this is a job in the national park service is located under the department of interior the section here basically outlines the duties. You go through and decide, oh, I can do these duties. I like these duties. I want to apply for that job. So you'll go down to the conditions of employment and just to make sure you qualify basically for these. So you, you, know, you have to be a U.S. citizen. You have to have a background investigation. Everyone does. If you're a male, you have to meet the selective service requirements. You have to agree to have your uh, uh, paycheck deposited electronically. You have to be able to operate a motor vehicle and have a driver's license. And it is the park service. You have to wear a uniform. You might have to work weekends, evenings, and overtime. And for every federal position, even if you're not a supervisor, you have one year, um, a one year probationary period where you can basically be fired if you're not doing um, satisfactory work. And then again, it's this one, it requires travel. So they have to give you a travel card. And if you work for the government, if you have a travel card, you need to take training um, for that. And that's basically what that is. And then the qualification section, this is what qualifications you're bringing to the job, what you have to have in order to apply for this position. And so oftentimes it's um, either just experience or education and experience. And this one, and it's a lot, there's a lot going on with this application. Um, basically uh, you can have education or a combination of education and experience or just experience. And all of that needs to kind of equal what it would be like to work as a GS9. Um, and then you can, you know, elevate up to a GS-11. Um, and then, you, and I should say this here, this includes volunteer experience. And this is what I think Rebecca mentioned, the internships and the volunteering come into play. It doesn't matter if you have, um, you know, you've done it. It doesn't matter if it's paid or unpaid work. It still counts for the federal government. And then if you have education, you must have copies of your transcripts available. They have to be legible, has to be from accredited institution. You have to provide them. Um, this part here, I think is kind of funny. Um, it, it talks a little bit about the physical demands. It tells you that you're gonna be working in an office. You're gonna have to sit around a lot, 
but also you'll be working in archives. So you might be working with dusty records or objects. I think um, I've definitely been there. And so this how you've been at be about how you'll be evaluated section is really the um, the most important section of the application and. I, I can say that not all agencies use the same format or language with their vacancy announcements and it really what they require varies, but what is universal and if you do not hear anything I say, but this is that. Um, your resume must match the qualifications outlined in the vacancy announcement and the questionnaire, which I'll get to. Um, your resume may be 10 pages long, and that's okay as long as it has all the information. And when I say match, I mean it uses the same terms and phrases that are used in the announcement and the questionnaire. And many people will say that you should just copy and paste phrases from the announcement and the questionnaire directly into your resume. And this is because the HR person who's looking at your application, the first cut, has no idea what this job entails. They know nothing about it. And so all they're looking for is keywords and key phrases. And so in order to get past that first, you know, I guess, step of the process, you need to have all this information in your resume. And so I cannot stress it enough. And this is what it basically says here. It says your qualifications may math. May, must um, be in your application materials, in your resume, in your transcripts. If you say you've done something in the uh, in the assessment slash questionnaire, and I should also say the terms are used interchangeably. So sometimes it's called an assessment, sometimes it's called a questionnaire, sometimes it's called, in this case, an assessment questionnaire. Um, if you fail to prove that you have these qualifications, you will not be passed on. Um, and then here, what they say is they'll get their pile of um, applicants, they'll weed out all the people who, who aren't qualified, and then they'll rank you qualified, well qualified, and best qualified. And they'll probably only contact the best qualified people, and um, everyone else will probably not be offered uh, ability to um, interview for this position. And now here's where it kind of gets a little annoying, because they don't tell you really what you're going to be evaluated on on this page. You have to go to another page in order to learn what these competencies are. But you know they're gonna be related to history, um, leadership, oral communication. I actually saw that star and there's literally no star anywhere else on this page. I don't know what it means. Um, partnering, project management. So these things you have to have experience in that. I wanted to quickly go over to the other job I showed you with the Air Force because um, they use things called KSAs in the military. Most military jobs do. And so they have, they're called knowledge, skills, and abilities. And basically you have to write these little essays on how you have experience. And so this one will have questions about how, you know, knowledge and history, historical mythology, and um, related social sciences. And so you be prepared to, to look at these questions and write these paragraphs about how you have experience doing all these things. And so it, that's a little bit different than you know, how they do it within um, this job here. And like I said, you're, you're, not, gonna, you're not gonna know. So you're, what you're gonna end up doing is, is there anything else? Okay, yeah, I'll go down here real quick. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna have to upload all of your required documents to USA Jobs, your resume, if you're using your education, your um, transcripts, if you're a veteran, your DD-214, um, all that you, you upload to USA Jobs, and then you basically hit, you know, you're going to hit apply first. And if I hit apply, it's not going to do anything because I'm not logged in. But basically, it will take you to a page that says you have to select your resume. So you have to have a resume ready, but that's not the resume you're going to be using when you actually apply for the job. It's just the resume, resume placeholder that you need before you're actually applied to the job. So you're going to hit apply to the job, you're going to upload that resume, and then it's going to take you to the website um, for the agency. And again, they're all different. Every agency does it different. The military does it different. Um, but in general, um, like I said, your resume needs to match the questionnaire. And so I um, downloaded the, the res because I'm not going to log in and have you go through all the questions. So I actually downloaded the, the questionnaire for you. And the questionnaire, um, this actually has two questionnaires. But the questionnaire slash assessment has a couple introductory questions like, are you a veteran? Are you former? Are you a federal employee? All that kind of demographic information. And then it has the meat of it and the questions. And these are what you'll be evaluated on. So this is like an example of um, 
one of the questions, develop and implement plans for inventory, evaluation, documentation, preservation, research, and interpretation of historic records. And then you all oftentimes, you'll have to have five choices, A through E, and A, I don't have any experience or education doing this, and E, I'm an expert. And what I will say is if your, your application has all A's and B's and no D's or E's, you will not get through. So this is where you have to think creatively. And I'm not at all encouraging anyone to lie. No one should lie. But you should think about the experiences you have and the education you have and the interns you have and how you have may have done these um, in the past. And then you literally paste, I have experience doing these things and I got it from when I did an internship at the National Archives. You know, so however it is, make sure these words are in that application or in your resume and hopefully you have enough experience um, to get a lot of D's and E's. Because if you don't get a lot of D's and E's, like I said, you're not gonna be, um, you're not gonna be passed on. Now, um, this also varies because like I said, there's in this section of the application for military or for the K, you usually have KSAs that you have to do. And those are narratives. Sometimes you have to do narratives for this as well. So they'll say, oh, you said, if you answer D or E, you have to explain where you got that um, experience. And you don't, you not only explain it, here, make sure that's also on your resume. And that's why your resume is 10 pages long because you've said, I have this experience here and then you have to have it on your resume as well. Otherwise, again, you will not get through. This one's actually pretty good because it's just multiple choice and the whole thing is multiple choice. You don't have to write anything. Um, and I've seen some actually that just say that doesn't even really have this section. It just says, um, I swear that all of these competencies are reflected in my resume. So again, your resume is really, really important. It has to have all this information. Now, hey, Jesse, yeah, are you are you wanting to show people that what you downloaded because we can't see it? Oh, you can't see it. Oh, no, so. sorry, we still see the USA job. <laughs> <laughs> well, I that's one. See, I guess I, you can't see my well. I think I think you might have to stop sharing your like Google Chrome and then share your. Oh, it's okay. I can just stop okay. sharing. I can just stop sharing my screen altogether because I really don't need that much more anywhere. Here, let me stop sharing first. Okay. Yeah. Um, basically, it was just assessment question assessment that said ask questions. So you don't really. The point is, it has to be on your resume. Um, but anyway, so. Where, oh, where, oh, yeah. So the um, where? Okay. So, like I said, oh yeah, I was gonna say that this the National Park Service, the job that I was actually showing you, which I was showing you, but now it doesn't matter. Um, it had two assessments, and one of them was basically you know showed you're qualified, and then the second one was um, like a quiz about your knowledge of like historic preservation, which I actually have never seen before. So then it's basically to weed out people who know nothing about historic preservation. So that is, um, as just be aware that you might have to do two assessments. And then in some agencies, and this is especially true about the military, they make you do an additional assessment that they won't send you until after you've applied for the position. So you apply for the position, and then about, you know, within the next day, they'll send you an email and you have to fill out another assessment that takes about three hours. And it covers topics like math, reasoning, decision making, integrity, and like, I think like interpersonal skills. And so I, in that document that I shared with you, there is a link to how you pass those kinds of assessments. And so if you've been able to get through this entire process, and like I said, a million times, make sure your resume has all of this information on it, then you, um, it, I know when somebody asked the question, like how long does it take? It might take a few weeks to hear back and it might take a few months to hear back. Um, you'll usually get an email from USA Jobs saying you either you know, made it through the first round, yay, you've been referred, or you were not referred to the hiring official. Either it could be that you were qualified but not qualified enough or that you weren't qualified at all. Sometimes you literally never hear back. And so there is a section in the USA Jobs, I'm not gonna reshare my screen, that um, by your profile that will kind of, you can track the progress of your job, um, your job announcement, I guess. And there's also in the vacancy announcement, there usually is a point of contact um, for the, anyone who's in charge, the person who's in charge of the job that you can contact if you have any questions about it. And so I know that's really quick. I know we don't have a lot of time left. So I'm just going to stop there. And I think we can either 
um, answer some of the questions in the document or we can just open it up to questions. Well, I just want to say something really quick to follow up on that. Um, and, you know, okay, so that sounds ridiculous, right? I mean, <laughs> ridiculous. But I just want to say also as like a hiring manager, but as a, a public historian too, that if you can get into the federal government system, um, that is a really good thing. You know, you can much more easily navigate it once you get in. Um, and it, it, you know, it's helpful because you kind of get some of this background stuff out of the way. And so other federal agencies, like if you're like, okay, this isn't quite the job for me or whatever, you know, that can, you can bring that to future jobs. The other thing that, um, you know, with the federal government, and I'm glad Jesse showed you that all the different grades and then all the steps there's a lot of ways and opportunities to kind of move around and move up that you may not have at other places. Um, you know, even in the state government too, but you know, it's kind of like once you're in, um, you can really see a lot of benefit <laughs> from that. So I just wanted to kind of give that extra plug to you. <laughs> Jesse, you're, you're muted. <laughs> I'm glad you made that point about getting in because a lot of people, especially if they have master's degrees or even PhDs, they don't really like taking the job at like the GS5 or a GS7 level, or maybe even, you know, um, if you can get in as a nine, but once you're in, you can move around so much easier, easier because a lot of positions are federal government employees only. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that often that it's general public, open to the general public. So if you can get in a job and maybe, you know, you're going to take a hit, you're going to be, you know, GS5 for a year. If you're good and you're interested, um, you're going to move up and you'll move up, um, you know, quickly. Yeah. And the other benefit too, is that, you know, the federal government's everywhere, right? So, you know, if you need to move for various reasons, there's that opportunity too. Um, you know, you're not just necessarily tied to like a particular place. And, you know, with this idea of going to remote working and teleworking, you know, that's a that's another great benefit. And it is something that we offer too at TechSpot, um, you know, for remote working too. So, um, yeah. but anyways. So how do y'all want to do the questions? I think if folks are, if folks have questions, they can either, I think, use the um, like raise hand function on Zoom if they want to ar articulate them vocally, or folks can put them in the chat and I'll try to keep an eye on it and throw them out to you all. So would anyone like to? to ask a question or we have that whole list of questions <laughs> that people yeah, also and there already are a bunch of questions okay. in the chat so well, I'll, go. I guess, oh. I'll go first hi everyone my name is uh dr jacqueline hudson i am a the S, uh, expositions content developer at the national underground railroad freedom center in cincinnati and um my question, and I put it in the chat as well, is that what are some like myths slash misconceptions about applying for government jobs, but also just in, you know, government jobs in general? Or like what what's some of the missing mis misconceptions that you've heard or encountered or or you know, so yeah, that's that's my big question about that because. Um, prior to getting this job that I have now, I, you know, heard that, that, you know, getting into the federal government is really hard if you're not already in there, but how do you get in there, you know, so it's like, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, a double edged sword with that. So yeah, that's, that's my thing is like the, like I said, while I was um, um, doing a, a seminar and there was somebody from the park service, I believe, who did a, a seminar and he was like, yeah, you kind of have to get an internship or whatnot is rarely that people like, like um, Jesse just said, is rarely for, you know, out the general public to get in as opposed to you, you already being in. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really rambling, rambling. So I'm going to get, I'm going to get off now. <laughs> I 
Rebecca, did you want me to take it or did? Sure, I guess. Um, I don't know if it's a myth, but I think you did touch on it that we do. Uh, I think ha having an internship at that agency that you want to work for, it, I can't say how invaluable that is um, because not only are you learning what's going to be you know, required as the job, you know, the people already. And so when these certs come, you know, you may get 10 people, um, you know, coming through you, the hiring managers don't know anyone on that. Normally, you know, they don't know. And, you know, maybe if they see your name on it, you're going to, you know, it's going to jump out at them. And so even though it's a fair process and you're not to hire people based upon, you know, favoritism or cronyism or, you know, nepotism or any of that stuff, um, if you're known, if you're an intern, you've worked there um, and you've done a good job, your application is going to stand out. And that's just how it is. Um, and so I would definitely, if you can um, do an internship and lots of internships now for the federal government are virtual. And I'm going to share a document, hopefully tomorrow, with all this information in it. Um, some internships are actually um, like paid. <laughs> and I think uh, Rebecca mentioned it, um, it, USA Jobs has a paid internship section. Um, and I mean, what could be better to get a paid internship that can turn into a, a federal job. And so that's kind of one of the things I think um, is important. But for like misconceptions, I don't know, I feel like USA Jobs is what it is. And there's no <laughs> myths about it. It's terrible. Um, so I don't know, Rebecca, did you have anything you wanted to add? I mean, what I'm, what comes to mind for me is really, you know, something that you might hope maybe would be more of a misconception, but it's a little bit more to the truth. Like we've kind of jumped around some of it, but you know, this hiring process can take a long time. Um, it can be bureaucratic and you, you work your way through the process and it's not like, you know, like I, if I decide to hire someone, I have to like write a memo that then gets approved by all these people. And then I send it to HR and then they send a conditional offer letter and then the person accepts it. And then they have to do their screenings and like their drug tests if they're drug tested and turn in their transcripts. And, and then it, the offer becomes final. And then I'm able to tell everyone else, you know, oh, you didn't get the job. Um, and then, and then depending on how long it takes to get through all of that, it could be, you know, three, four, five months between from when you interviewed and, um, when you actually get to start work to, um, so I just wanted to be real about that, but sometimes it can go a lot more quickly if you're very special and blessed. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, you know, we always want them to go as fast the postings and to go as fast as possible because we need people, but it's just, we've got to work our way through this bureaucracy um, that is set up for various reasons to comply with various laws. Um, that's the other thing too, is that we may not be as able to be as flexible as like a nonprofit or something else as, as far as like making job offers and like responding to negotiations about certain things. Um, you know, if I post a job um, that is similar to like the grade uh, that Jesse showed you, I can only hire to that grade. So if I have a really great employee that, or applicant that doesn't quite meet that grade, um, I can't hire you. I'd have to post another job that then allows for me to hire in that grade. And so that's a little frustrating too, because as a hiring manager, I have to kind of think about, okay, who's the potential to hire and who do I want versus who can I realistically get and stuff. And then within that grade, I have a very specific hiring salary range um, that can be only managed so far. And so, you know, that is, that's the reality sometimes of government, I mean, a lot of jobs, but really with government jobs, I feel can be a little more restricted and less flexible that way. Can I answer a follow-up question? Um, is there a difference like, or does it kind of work the same way between um, federal and state? Um, I just wanted to know, was there like, does it operate the same way or is there a little more flexibility in the state, on the state level? Mm -hmm. I'm just at, you know, <laughs> just, just curious. <laughs> I mean, well, it's going to depend on your state, unfortunately. 50 <laughs> states like in the District of Columbia. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, it depends on the state. It depends on the agency. Um, but a lot of what Jesse said 
you know, for in my experience, at least working for a couple of different states, like you don't need to like directly cut and paste from the job posting into your resume or application. However, using those terms and directly addressing how you meet the specifications in the job posting are always going to get you miles ahead of other applicants who just kind of blanket, you know, throw out resumes and not tailor them to jobs. And um, that'll be the case across the board, I would think. And what I can say is, you know, you go through this USA jobs process where you have all these questionnaires and KSAs, but then if you make it to the interview process, those are, it's like those didn't happen. And then they have these like set questions that they ask you that have nothing to do with the job. And it's, it's insane really. And they're set and you have to ask everyone the same questions and they may be, you know, give me an example of your problem solving skills, or give me an example of one time where you had a, you know, a conflict with another employee and how did you deal with it? And then these, all these scenarios that have nothing to do with the application that you submitted. And it's a very frustrating process because you have done all this work to apply for this job. And these questions are like, you know, so vague. And that's just how the federal, at least the federal government, I don't know if it's in the, um, in states now, it's moved to this very generic questions and everything's trying to be more and more generic. So even USA Jobs is getting more generic. And so they're not tailored to history specific. It's tailored to these general, like, I guess, soft skills or like, yeah. I don't know, it's, it's insane. Yeah. When you get through and you have a job, think, write down your questions that they ask you. And they're usually like eight part questions. And so they read it to you. And then you're like, what did you just ask me? It is. We do do those <laughs> multi-part questions. I can say that. <laughs> see that Elizabeth has their hand up. Elizabeth, if you'd like to unmute and ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Sorry, I'm sort of got light behind me so you can't see me, but there is a real person here. Um, <laughs> I had two questions for you, and that is, and they may differ, but for, for both of you, one is roughly how far ahead to wanting to do a, a summer internship should the interns start um, applying? And the second question is, generally speaking, what kind of experience if it's answerable, what kind of experience are you looking for for interns? In other words, what can I do to help my students, my history students and public history students be more successful in getting an internship? Do you want me to answer that one first? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I can say for us specifically, our internship, our internships are posted like jobs. So, um, for summer interns, we usually tend to get them posted in January. Um, and because we start our summer programs in May. And so that gives time, people time to apply. And then we do job interviews and they like they're hired on at the state. So they have to go through the process. They have to submit transcripts to show that to prove that you're, you know, in a, in a program. Um, you know, it depends on what you're doing. If you're going to be working like in the field, you may have to be drug tested, you know, and then get hired on and actually start. So we start in, in January and they're posted online. We also try to, um, spread the word through, you know, multiple preservation, public history job sites. Um, as far as skills, you know, that's, that's a little bit harder because it is an internship. So we're not expecting you to bring a lot of things to the table, but you know, like Jesse said, a lot, we're looking, so we're looking a lot less for, um, you know, technical skills, but a lot more for like communications, you know, have you ever worked before? Um, I've had some interns where it's been very clear that they've never really worked a job before. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> that, that helps people stand out if they, any work experience, I mean, I don't care if it's at, um, you know, gap or whatever, but you've had to show up on time in a professional manner and deal with other people, um, makes a big difference that can make you stand out as an intern in an application. Um, and just an enthusiasm. I want to see that too, you know, and not like, oh, I'm forced to do this because I have to get it to graduate. But, you know, show that you maybe looked a little bit into, you know, why Tech Dot's hiring a historian or whatever. 
and just, you know, that you're enthusiastic about it. And that goes a long way too. Um, and I have to echo everything that Rebecca said. I agree with that. Um, for the federal government, a lot of times, several months in advance, because we have most interns have to go through a background investigation before they can start and actually get their their badge. So um, January for summer, if it's available, um, and then for skills, like for me personally with interns, in addition to everything that Rebecca said. I'm really, um, cause my interns do a lot of writing. And so I require a writing, a short writing sample. And I want you to be able to write for the general public. And this is very different than writing for an academic audience. And so if you have a writing sample that you've written something for the general public, it's much better than having like an academic paper you submitted because that's not what you'll be doing um, in like my internship, at least. You're not going to be writing research papers. You're going to be writing um, a for a blog. You're going to be writing for the public. Um, and also, and this is the opposite, I would say, when you're applying for a job, I would recommend not doing a cover letter because one little error in it might like turn off the hiring manager and it's not at all required. I love when interns submit cover letters because I, I know you can write if it's well-written and it just distinctly has all of everything right there instead of a resume that has all the information. So like if they can write a good cover letter that has all, cause you know, my internship will tell you what, what you're going to be doing and they'll say, oh, I have experience doing oral histories or I've at least edited some oral histories oh, I, you know, I've written for this, I wrote this. And so that's the kind of thing that at least I'm looking for in internships. But I would also say it varies vastly in the federal government. Um, but most of the time they're, the interns will be doing like work. They, will, they won't be doing like photocopying and, you know, getting coffee. They're going to be doing work. They're going to be, you know, writing. They're going to be researching. They're going to be, you know, doing metadata for photos, scanning photos. It's going to be a really good experience for them. Yeah, and that's my goal too with our internships is to come out of it with a product that they can take, you know, to apply to a job with Jesse. And they can be like, here's a writing sample I did for Textot or whatever, um, you know, for, or for whomever, and um, come out with something that they actually accomplished that hopefully Textot will then use. And we use a lot of our interns' work. You know, they do a lot of really cool stuff for us. So, no, thank uh, you very much. Just, that's very helpful. Just, just to speak up as a former intern coordinator, um, one key that I've noticed with undergraduates um, applying for internships, following instructions is key. If the internship application says three pages, just send three pages. Don't send four, don't send two, don't send six. Um, if the intern application requests a writing sample at a specific page length, send it at that specific page length. Don't go beyond, don't go higher, don't go lower. Um, finally, if you're applying for an internship with the State Department's Office of the Historian and you send it to the House of Representatives Office of the Historian, you're not gonna get any feedback. Make sure you know who you're writing to and when. Following instructions, reading is fundamental. As long as they keep that in mind, they will they will go far in getting the internship that they want. You would be surprised at the number that at least that I've seen over the years where they get where they just didn't listen. Oh no, I've seen it too. Oh, no, me too. Parents. <laughs> and thank you again. I know we're coming up on the hour, but are there other questions that folks wanted to ask either verbally or in the chat? I, I don't see where I can do um, a raising the hand. So I'm kind of coming in and blobbing. Blech. I have a question and it probably isn't any question these young people would have. I am a history major finally at my age. And I have found that by uh, going into job interviews and uh, doing the interviewing, I'm being told in some cases, which is illegal, that they're looking for someone to be with them for 10 to 15 years and that I don't think you're the right fit for us, which is telling me you're too old lady, we can't handle you. Now, that being said, I currently have, as of May, 
an IT degree, which I got because I wanted to know more about how things work with IT and, and technology because that's the future. And then when I finished that, I was able to go back and start working back on my degree, which I'm, I think they call me a junior senior somewhere in there. I, I don't know. Um, and I'm looking forward to that because I'm going to graduate finally with the degree I wanted to begin with. That being said, oh, what was I going to say? Um, what, what can I do? I'm a veteran who's disabled. I am an older lady and I have a degree and I'm getting a history degree and I have a lot of experience. I've done a lot of travel because being in the military, those of you who have dealt with military, you know, we travel a lot. Um, I'm not just a single person that speaks one language. I also speak two languages fluently and one or two languages where I could probably get a meal and find the bathroom. You, you know how that goes, you know, donde esta and then whatever, and they could point. So what, what kind of help can I get? Because I do want to have a job to finish with what I want to do in life, like send off in, in the last 10, 15 years, whatever it is that I get to have, a send off with a job that I really enjoy and go. <laughs> Well, congratulations um, on your upcoming degree. You should have no problem getting a federal government job. Um, how you get ranked in your application, there's additional points if you're a veteran. There's additional points if you're a disabled veteran. When our certs come, we have lots of veterans on them. Um, so I don't, I don't under, I, I guess, aside from the fact that they're your um, prospective employers are blatantly violating uh, laws. Um, I don't think that what you described, it sounds like you'd be a perfect candidate. Most um, people coming into the federal government don't stay at one job necessarily for, you know, 10 years anyway. So they're, they're, their requirements are already unrealistic. And so, like I said, you, you shouldn't have any trouble with the federal government process. When you start applying for jobs, just have your, you know, your GD-214, have your paperwork together, have all your ducks in a row, have it all uploaded to USA Jobs, and then you should come at the top of every single one of those cert, cert lists. Are there any other questions that folks have for Jesse or Rebecca? This is Megan. I saw in the spreadsheet that there was a question about, and I'm sure that we'll get into this in the future hangout with the consultants as well. Uh, there was a question about how folks who are interested in contract work uh, with the government can find that that work. And I wonder if you could speak to that. And if you can't, maybe Sue, who I think is here, could jump in because uh, I know Sue does a lot of that work too. Um, I also yeah. have a question at some point, but take care of her first. Just real quick, do you have any tips for the best ways to find contract curriculum development or research jobs? I mean, all of our contracting work is posted on, um, on it's like work for Texas or work in Texas.gov. Like we have, you know, we're required to post all these things, you know? Um, and so just kind of knowing those websites where those, um, RFPs or contracting things are going to be posted. Um, once again, setting up like a Google search or alert or just automatically going to check them um, is really kind of the best way to do it for Texas. And it'll, it'll be the site where um, all of the Texas state agencies are posting all of the contracts and POs and things like that that we're trying to do. And for the federal government, a lot of the times they contract with like a company. And so like, for instance, there's like history associates, associates. And so you can get a position with them and then you can get contracted through that. Um, that's probably the most, the easiest way to get um, into a federal contract position. And uh, my question was, if we wanted to apply for the National Park Service, would you just do that online or what would be the process there? The National Park Service goes through USA Jobs as well. So the job that I was showing you was a National Park Service job. 
And so you do the whole process with USA jobs and uploading your resume and your transcripts and all your supporting materials. And then doing that. Um, and that USA job this is a website, right? It's yeah, it's the website. Uh, I, I only got here like five minutes ago. So, oh yeah, you missed like, yeah, that's why you asked that question. <laughs> Whoops. That's okay. We're gonna make the recording available, so you'll get an email with a link to this recording, ah, so you can okay. go back and check ah, all that. I will definitely go back and watch that. Great. Any final questions or thoughts for Rebecca or Jesse? No. Well, awesome. And. Uh, just to respect everyone's time, since I know um, this was only slotted for an hour, I think we'll start to wrap things up there. Um, so I want to thank Jesse and Rebecca for their time this evening. This has been very helpful. I've taken lots of my own notes because I'm also very interested in applying for a government job and we'll be doing so here in not too short a time. Um, so um, again, thank you, Jesse and Rebecca, and thank you all for coming on uh, this Wednesday night, and I hope you all have a lovely rest of your evening, and we'll be um, in touch soon with the video recording from this evening as well. Yeah, thanks everyone. I enjoyed it. Good night.